Doesn't Niner affect sucks, us. Who cares? Yeah. <laughs> everybody, everybody, today, everybody. I don't care. I hate everybody after that. <laughs> and what, did you bet on the game? No. No. That's, yeah, <laughs> okay. and, and that's why I don't bet because I get this angry with no money. In with no money. <laughs> All right, okay, so now we're gonna be talking about, oh, oh, see, now when I want it to spin, it doesn't. There we go. This one, isn't this a kid's game? So Derrick Henry, what's going on with Derrick Henry? Derrick Henry had a Jones fracture. What is a Jones fracture? Well, Dr. Jones, a Jones fracture is your fifth metatarsal and involves the base of the fifth metatarsal. And there's a watershed area, watershed you say. Well, watershed basically means there's an area which doesn't have great blood supply and circulation. There is blood supply, but it's an area from the metaphyseal to the shaft area of bone where the blood supply comes to one area and then it peters out because then you rely on the intermedullary blood supply of the bone. And so if you have a fracture in that area called a Jones fracture, the risk of non-union or not healing or delayed healing is high. So more often than not, especially in the pro athletes because you want to get, get them back into play. Now, you know, we don't want the Titans in the game because the 40, well, 49ers suck as of yesterday. However, that's all coaching. The players are awesome. The coaching sucks. We know that. However, we still don't want the Titans to do well, but we want the player to do okay because we want an even game. We want like top teams battling it out until the 49ers win. That's all that really matters. So, so getting back to the Jones fracture. So this is actually one of those like unfair disadvantage fractures. Because if you have a Jones fracture, you are at an unfair disadvantage of having a fracture that doesn't heal. And that's why in these cases, operative intervention is more often indicated than not indicated. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone with a Jones type fracture or a Jones fracture or a fracture of the fifth metatarsal proximal uh, aspect of the bone has to have surgery. No, that's not the case. In pro athletes, because you want them back in the game, more often than not, the benefit risk falls in favor of operative intervention versus not. Because you're taking a load on that area, it's also a, uh, one of the perineal tendons attaches to that, and so there's a tendency to pull that off, and you don't want it to displace. So you'll put one screw, and it's a lag screw. If you don't know what lag is, ask your buddy, your neighbor down the street who does construction, you know, the guy that has all the tools, just ask him what a lag screw is. And you basically put a lag screw in to compress across that bone because compression is what bone likes. Bone likes impact loading because it stimulates the osteon, stimulates the blood supply. Now, if you have too much of that, it's bad. A little bit of micromotion is good. It stimulates the osteon cells to move. But if it's too much motion or you have more than a certain amount of gap, the critical size defect gap in tibia or femur is about two centimeters in any of these Jones fractures, it's probably two millimeters. If you're less than a millimeter, you may heal. If you're more than that, you may not heal. But specifically in a Jones fracture, the risk of non-union versus union is favoring non-union, so you may actually want to fix it, but not in all cases because everything is patient-specific, and we're talking about a patient who's a pro athlete for the Titans, whom we don't want to do well, um, that is actually wants to get back into the game and already had the surgery, so that's what we're talking about. So let's not m make any confusion. This is not a recommendation for you, the viewer. This is what we're discussing right now for a Jones fracture in this player whom we don't want to recover. So when you have this, the screw compresses the bone, stimulates the healing, and then it can heal. And this area of the bone, the metaphyseal shaft junction, 
you is about six to eight weeks to heal. Now, there's clinical healing, there's radiographic healing. Clinical healing is you have no pain when you tap on it and put pressure on it, but you can still see the fracture or the fracture line on the x-ray. So you don't have bridging bone completely, and you may see in one to two out of four views that there's still a gap or a fracture line visible. Once you get to more, you know, 75% healing, so three out of four images, for example, have good bridging bone, then it's radiographically healed. And then it's a spectrum. It's everything in between. Some will heal in four weeks. Some will take 12 weeks. It varies. It's patient specific. Depends on the biology and what you're on. And when I say what you're on, medications can affect what you're, uh, you're healing. Your food intake can affect what you're healing. For example, if, all, if you smoke, eat McDonald's and Sundays every single day, so high fat, high sugar content, content and nicotine, the odds are you're not gonna heal as fast as someone or as well or as strong as someone who has a well, good, healthy, balanced diet and is a non-smoker. I already spoke about nicotine and smoking. Uh, there's an anti-smoking uh, campaign banner on the website. Oh, there isn't? Okay, there should be an anti-smoking banner on this website, but my media guy is too busy chuckling at me right now. So anyway, um, so once the fracture heals, you can get the uh, patient back into the game and start playing. If you have clinical healing prior to radiographic healing, you can start strengthening. And the decision on strengthening can vary. Strengthening is when you're actually taking more pressure on the bone that includes your full weight bearing or a progressively increased weight bearing from say 10 to 20% of your body weight all the way up to 80 to 90 to 100% of your body weight plus strengthening, so that means lifting, um, you know, weights or um, uh, doing any kind of resistant strengthening exercises where you're using uh, weights to counteract and build muscle, okay? And uh, strengthening isn't just this, but if you lift 100 pounds with your pinky, which I can do, of course, um, then you're strengthening that digit. And so it's hard to strengthen this particular area, but if you're using your toe flexors and extenders and putting your full body weight and starting to pivot on your foot and ankle, you're starting to stress and strain the bone and put forces through the fracture site. You don't wanna do that too early because it can displace or re-break because there's when you have a screw in something, there is non-biological material and biological material. And there's an interface between the metal non or titanium, non-biological material and the biological material. That can create a stress riser. A stress riser is basically an increased force to surface area um, um, parameter whereby there can be an increased load at that junction. So if you have biological material and non-biological material and this is stiffer on this side where the metal is versus the other side which is just the bone then it can create a stress riser and so it could actually have a little bit of play. So if this is stiff and this is not stiff and the implant is right here, then this poses an area of potential fragility or fracture uh, mechanism. So that's all that it is. So we have to be careful about the implants we use, what we use, the materials we use, how we use it, how far we go in with it, and whether we take that screw out at a certain point. And then of course there's risk with hardware in, hardware out. In the end, a fracture that's healed will be allowed to return back to play and there is a component of rehab, conditioning, and the mental game.
We've talked about all that before, but six to eight weeks, is that reasonable? It depends on the player. If it heals, great. And sometimes the healing component, a lot of times these players will supplement. Now, I'm not saying they're using any kind of anabolic or catabolic steroids or other things, but growth hormone, parathyroid hormone, Forteo, those are things that people have used to improve bone healing. They're not they won't be covered by insurance for this particular area, but for some of these athletes, they'll just pay out of pocket cash for this, or the team will, or the player will, or whether it's legal or illegal is not for my purview, I'm just talking about the biology of healing and what's out there that can actually stimulate healing. So, and so why does Forteo or parathyroid hormone not be approved for bone healing when biologically we know it does? Well, it really comes down to risk and money. Uh, a company, will it want to take the risk of going through the regulatory body and providing a complex, large clinical study to show that they're actually improving bone healing? And if they risk that big pot of money as a gamble and they get denied, then they've gone through all of this and spent billions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars and gotten nothing out of it. So really, it comes down to that a company is not willing to take the risk for you as a patient to get a drug approved that can actually help you, but it's not being done because the fat cows and the bean counters at these big companies don't really care enough about you as the patient, all they care about is their dollars and cents. Because the FDA is a protective body for you as a patient about benefit and risk. And in order for a company to get an approval for a fracture healing product, they have to spend a lot of money, which makes sense because there's clinical trials for safety and adverse event review so that you as a patient can feel comfortable that if it's FDA approved or FDA cleared, that it's safe for you to use within a reasonable safety profile. It doesn't mean there's no risk, but it's within a, a margin of safety that's acceptable to the public good. That hasn't happened yet. So, a lot of times these drugs are used out of pocket, not covered by insurance, and maybe they're thrown into a clinical trial or used off-label. Because a doctor like me can prescribe and administer drugs that we see biological benefit, but they're not approved and labeled for that use off-label. And so technically, even if it's not FDA approved or FDA, well, it's definitely FDA regulated, but if it's not FDA approved or cleared, it can still be prescribed, but it won't be covered by your insurance. That's probably more information than you needed, but that's why some of these pro athletes and celebrities get access to medications that you, as the public, can't get access to because you're not going to pay thousands of dollars a day or hundreds of thousands of dollars or more than that to get these medications in you, even though there's good clinical data, it hasn't gone through the FDA process, and then there's a whole insurance company. Does the insurance company want to pay for it? Well, that's another conversation that we're not going to get into now. So getting back to this injury, was that a long-winded answer to this? Yeah. Yeah. See, my media guy's chuckling now. He's like, all he's thinking is, how am I going to edit the crap out of what he said right now? So. The fracture will heal, patient will rehab, and we'll see the Titans lose. Did I just say that? Yes, I did.